My name is Karen Tucker, and welcome to our Churchill Club program called Mobile Moments, the new battleground for customers. We're privileged to have with us a distinguished group of speakers. We have Sasha from Redfin, Sriram from Facebook, James from Greylock, and uh, Jeff will be joining us soon from Twilio, and of course, Ted from Forrester Research. Thank you very much for being with us. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mina from Uber was called away on a family emergency and sends her apologies. She's unable to be with us as expected this morning. We wish her well. We would like to thank our research partner, Forrester, and our host, Citrix Systems, for making this program possible. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs> a word about Churchill Club, a nonprofit business and technology forum around since 1985 here in Silicon Valley and very much a part of the culture here of free exchange of ideas. We put, up, uh, put on up to 40 programs each year in the interest of encouraging innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we try to create an environment that's future focused. We talk about things like what's new, next, not widely known. We respectfully ask our speakers not to pitch but rather to share uh, their own insights and vision about where things are going and how that might affect innovation, economic growth, et cetera. So hopefully you all this morning will walk out with some fresh ideas and hopefully be inspired to action as well. Uh, let's see. And as for what's coming up, we do have a private event next Friday that I wanted to tell you about. It's private because we're wanting to have everybody in the audience have a strong connection to the topic, which is basically technology, jobs, and the future of work. And the discussion will be framed around the question, will technological advances automate tasks more quickly than we can create new jobs? And the speakers are going to include Martin Bailey, Laura Tyson, Kurt Carlson, Reed Hoffman, Tim O'Reilly. It is, will be a quite uh, remarkable program. It is a breakfast in San Francisco. If you have a strong connection to the topic and perspectives about it that you would like to share, please let me know today and I will see to it that you get an invitation. Also, please be with us on September 25th for the Churchills, one of our most special annual events. It highlights excellence in four areas that most of us care quite a bit about, innovation, collaboration, leadership, and social good. Three of our honor honorees this year will be Airbnb for the Game Changer, Malala Yousafzai, the Pakistani woman who is re very bravely standing up for women in education as our global benefactor, uh, and Paul Jacobs as our legendary leader. Our magical team will be announced very shortly, and it is quite an extraordinary event. You can learn more about the other programs that we're doing at churchillclub.org. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club and you'll find other Twitter codes in your programs. Our moderator, Ted Shadler, is VP and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. And his particular fascination over the 24 years that he has spent in the tech-related industry is with the impact of disruptive technologies on workforce and workforce productivity. Before he became an analyst, Ted was a startup entrepreneur and also CTO and Director of Engineering for a healthcare software company. He has co-authored two books, including the brand new The Mobile Mind Shift, Engineer Your Business to Win in the Mobile Moment. We certainly look forward to the conversation that he will lead for us this morning. Please give a warm Churchill Club welcome to Ted Shadler. Good morning, everyone. Unfortunately, my chair is pointing this way. Don't some, I'll do my best to include you guys, too. Uh, I want to start with a very simple thing. I'll ask you to pull out your, your phone. And uh, I'll ask you to light it up. Put, type in your pin. You don't have to show it to me. It's OK. Uh, hand it to your neighbor. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's not working. So it's 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 All right, I can tell I'm in Silicon Valley because you're actually handing it to your neighbor. <laughs> you are a risk taker. 
You are comfortable with discomfort. <laughs> I admire that. <laughs> it's a pretty amazing feeling, isn't it? <laughs> You're like handing away the keys to your kingdom when you give somebody your smartphone. You feel kind of naked, <laughs> you know? A little powerless. We're good. We're good. <laughs> like, oh my God, how am I going to find my way to that next gig? <laughs> so you can take your phones back and put them away and silence them and all that good stuff. I think, I think the point's clear. The point is that we are so dependent on this technology to be who we are, be better at who we are, to get service in the moment we need it most. Uh, to fill the tiny little cracks in our day with fun stuff, stuff that keeps us interested and engaged. Uh, it's also a little, you know, distancing. We spend time like this instead of like this. But these mobile moments throughout our day as parents, as employees, as shoppers, as drivers, as passengers, as annoyed travelers, we've become very dependent on them and reliant on them. And we look for more. We look for more service. And so the central theme in this book, and I'm just going to say one more thing about it, is how, as a company, do you identify, prioritize, and deliver service in the mobile moments of your customers, business customers, consumers, and your employees? How do you do that? And you do that with an agile process. So I'm not going to say anything more about the book. I will say we're just getting going. We've got a billion smartphones, roughly. We're on our way to 2.5 billion smartphones globally by 2017. That's a Forrester forecast. We're at about uh, 300 million tablets. We're on our way to almost 900 million tablets in the same time frame globally. Another uh, forecast. 21% of US adults have shifted. Multiple devices, multiple locations. Probably everybody in this room has shifted. But not everybody in the world has shifted. And this is a little bit of a valley thing. Everybody in the valley is a kind of ahead of the curve. Not everybody, but the folks in our industry. But in the rest of the, of the uh, country, and in fact, the rest of the world, more shifting will happen. We're really just getting going of shifted behavior as a mass market phenomenon. So we'll hit 40%, 60%, maybe even 70 80% of the population shifted over the next 10 years. So what we've learned today will have a long trajectory of influence, impact, and money. So those are the things I wanted to uh, kind of share as starting points. Um, we're going to kind of pause here and let the panelists introduce themselves to you. Uh, we want to keep this real short. So kind of name, rank, and serial number. No, <laughs> name, uh, company, the last company you worked for prior to the company that you're at now, and uh, your role, your title and, and role. So keep it to like a minute, if you would, please. Sure. My name is Sasha Aiken. Uh, I am the CTO at Redfin. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of Redfin, we're an online uh, technology-powered uh, real estate brokerage uh, where people can search for all the homes for sale go, and then actually go in and see homes with Redfin agents and buy homes with Redfin agents. Uh, I've been at Redfin for about eight years. And before that, the, the, actually the endeavor I did before that was I actually made an independent documentary. But for, by myself, so Whoa. yeah, weird, huh? That's cool. <laughs> wow. Okay. No, I wish my password was interesting. Uh, okay, I'm Sridham. Uh, I'm a product manager uh, at Facebook, uh, fairly large social network topic of a popular movie, <laughs> uh, <laughs> among other things. Uh, what I do is I focus primarily on mobile ads, uh, and 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 in mobile ads, I focus on publisher monetization. Um, before Facebook, I spent a bunch of years working at Microsoft on cloud computing and virtualization, probably close to what a lot of folks here do at Citrix. So. I'm James, James Slavitt. Um, I, am the, um, I come as the member of the venture capital species <laughs> up here, so I'm surrounded by uh, entrepreneurs who uh, build stuff. And, 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 uh, and uh, so I, I will hopefully bring uh, some perspective that kind of spans across uh, just the many, many companies that we get to meet, uh, you know, every year um, to look at for potential investment, and then the companies we actually do invest in. So, uh, we we invest in uh, software-driven businesses. There are about ten colleagues I work with uh, as partners. We have a billion-dollar fund, and half of us do consumer investing. So we're investors in Facebook and LinkedIn, Pandora, Airbnb, Redfin. 
Uh, and then also we invest in enterprise uh, companies, so companies like Workday and Palo Alto Networks and ServiceNow and others. So I also have an even longer list of amazing companies we didn't invest in, which is what keeps me up at night. So uh, if you want to understand the, uh, the, the agony as opposed to the thrill side of my job, we can talk about that too. Uh, and mobile is having a, a massive impact on the companies we look at for investment and also a lot of the companies we're invested in. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of those observations. Great. Thanks, James. Uh, hi, Jeff. I'm Jeff Lawson, uh, CEO and co-founder of Twilio. Uh, we are infrastructure for uh, communications, moving communications from its legacy in hardware to its future in software living in the cloud. Um, before starting Twilio, uh, I was in product at Amazon Web Services, actually in the very early days of AWS. Um, where I joined in about 2004. In fact, they wouldn't tell me what AWS was before I started, so I had no idea what I was getting into, but it turned out to be something pretty cool, and um, I don't know, but you guys already learned something today, that the life of a venture capitalist is a life of regret. <laughs> uh, so that's pretty cool, we're already off to a good start. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, the rules of engagement here are let's, uh, let's keep it lively, let's mix it up, let's challenge each other where appropriate. Um, I'd like to move through a bunch of questions that uh, I've teed up, but also we're going to reach out to you for your questions kind of as we go. So I'll, I'll start the thing rolling and then uh, in, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, maybe we'll uh, take some questions from the audience and we'll come back up here, we'll go back to the audience. So it'll be kind of a back and forth as far as who gets to ask questions. So start thinking about some of the things on your mind uh, as we're getting going here. So, so mobile's a, a big topic. It's, uh, it's the tail that wags the dog. It touches really every aspect of our economy and uh, our companies and our lives, as we, as we talked about already here. Uh, there are a lot of ways to get started in this uh, discussion, but I really want to start with a, a big one, a kahuna. It is really that mobile devices are with us at all times, and that makes them tremendously different from web. And I would like to hear from folks who would like to jump in how mobile is different from web. In what ways do you treat mobile and mobile experiences as different from web and web experiences? And uh, who would like to, uh, to kick us off on that? I, mean, I can jump in on how I think about it. Um, I mean, I think the mobile user we see, uh, I mean, I think when you're building product, the first thing you always start with is empathy. Empathy for the user, what they're doing, where they are, meet them where they are. And mobile users, we find, are certainly much more, I want to say this in a politic way, but demanding. I mean, I think they expect things to happen much more quickly. Uh, as we've seen at Redfin, as we've seen more people uh, using our app versus our website, we see more and more requests for tours into homes the same day. Um, 2011, we had something like 40% of our homes requests were the same day. We're approaching now 60% are for just later that day, within a few hours. People want it now. Um, so it raises the impatience level of getting service, absolutely. moving forward, taking action. Good, that's a good one. Others have a view on this, and we're thinking about kind of, you know, what the implications are really for our, for our future. Okay. I'll get in there. Come on. Yeah. I'll get come, in on there. come on. Come on. These guys. Talk. I mean, I'll, I will, Karen has heard me talk about this before. I'll start with this, and then we'll get into other stuff. But just to build on what Sasha just said, I think the, 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 the big picture implication is, I call it the last second economy, but it's the idea that, uh, that we are now increasingly uh, you know, used to being able to do things with simplicity and ease uh, and a compressed time frame on our phone, and that's changing our expectations uh, and just how we behave, how we consume. Uh, I think you know, it's been very well documented in some categories of the economy, the impact this is having, like in transportation or in delivery and you know um, that people expect to be able to press a button and you know and get a ride or get a burrito um, I personally <laughs> and, you know and, and, and the, the mobile impact is partly on the on the consumer side the demand side but it's also a very big impact on the supply side uh, which is that you know there are people who um, are out and about in the world and they can actually provide on-demand service the part the impact that I actually see that is not fully played out but I think will be bigger and more exciting and potentially more opportunity for entrepreneurs versus you know, uh, competing uh, for the last mile with Amazon and Google and Facebook and, you know, is actually the impact on the, on the knowledge economy. So I think that uh, the consumer applications will be things like, uh, I don't want to take my kid down at 2 o'clock in the morning to urgent care. I want to be able to just uh, actually get concierge remote medicine on my phone. It's something we've talked about for a long time. It is going to happen with billions of smartphones. 
Uh, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm stuck on something and I need a tutor, I don't need to like schedule an appointment to meet someone like that. That will happen. Um, if I want to interact with a business, uh, I have a question, I'm looking for something that's in stock, I will be able to just text message with a business or multiple businesses to find what it is that I want. That's happening now in China through Tencent and WeChat. You see that now. Uh, you know, so if, I have, if, I'm, if I'm looking for an expert to help me with my business, like I'm looking for an intellectual property lawyer or a search marketing consultant, I'll be able to just phone a friend through my, you know, and, and connect into the right person. So the big picture impact, I think, is what I call the last second economy. That it's basically this getting access to help on demand. Yeah, whatever you want, wherever you are, in your immediate context, yeah. right. that mobile moment of when I need it, which is always now. Right. Absolutely. Any other thoughts here? Uh, you know, I think for a lot of us who grew up in the desktop era, the idea of carrying a computer but in your pocket is pretty compelling. Uh, but phones are inherently different in that they are so personal to you as a device. Right. Uh, I would probably be happy to give my desktop computer over to you. Uh, and so I think that means that the experience that you show the people who use your app or your service needs to be so much more personalized. Yeah. And I think at yeah. Facebook, you know, we care like a lot about that, which is, hey, you open up your phone, you know, we might have like, just a few seconds to capture your attention. How do we show you the most relevant things? You know, your your friend having a baby or that photo from that party, how do you just show the most relevant thing and the most personalized experience in like a very, maybe even just a brief window of time. So I think personal, which I think ties into context and ties into like location and who you are, uh, is just super important. I mean, I absolutely agree. Like the other thing we see on mobile is not just that people want it now, but it's just, phys I mean, it's physics. We have fewer pixels right. and we have fewer seconds. Um, people on mobile have meant much uh, faster session times, you know, they, they just jump into the app, they jump back out, they jump into the app, whereas people on the web we see do much more searching for homes, spend a lot of time looking at homes. And so we just, I mean, it's a law of physics. It is uh, indeed. Like, right. So you Jeff, just have to concentrate on what people I wanna, want. I want to push this forward on something, but I'm interested in Jeff's view on this. Oh, well, you know, it's a very interesting thing that, that we see um, at Twilio, which is... Could you I'm have had Twilio without mobile? Could we have had uh, Yeah, it just would have been a lot less fun. Uh, it's called. It's called. Tell me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, the um, the interesting thing that we see going on, like of our customers, you think about uh, Uber or Lyft or Airbnb. Like a lot of our customers using communications as part of the experience of using the app, yeah. which really makes that experience complete and often allows it to work, but also creates this great customer experience for you as the user. Um, and you think about, like, you know, you've got the Comcast CEO walking around saying, we want the Uber customer experience, right? Um, and what you really are, are sort of talking about is this integrated experience of using an app, summoning whatever it is you're trying to summon or whatever you're trying to accomplish, and also having the communications with that app, with that service, or with the service provider, like, woven into it. And it's really interesting. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I often, uh, one of the points I often make to people when they sort of ask, how is communications changing? They say, you know, 10 years ago, communications was a standalone activity because you'd get up and walk to your communications thing, like a, a telephone, and you'd hit wall. 10 digits, right? And, and it was like this standalone activity, and now communications is getting woven into everything that we do. It's ceasing to be a standalone activity. It's, no, I just hailed a cab, and then I get a text message that says, hey, it's coming in two minutes. It's uh, essentially just woven into our lives. Yeah. And we will, 10 years from now, cease to think of communications as an activity in and of itself, yeah. but rather just a seamless part of everything that we're doing. Yeah. So, this, so, talk about this for a second. so yeah. the communication thread is just, this is a huge thread we could pull out in a bunch of different ways. I mean, one, uh, to riff on what Jeff had said, the, on, on the marketplace or transaction side of things, uh, if you look at, um, like historically, it looked like, like an eBay, the way that trust was created through eBay, a lot of it was actually through reputation systems and reviews. And if you look at actually this more recent generation of companies, like if you look at Airbnb, a lot of how trust is actually established through Airbnb is actually, it's actually less around ratings and reputation. It's more around just letting the, the person who owns the home or the apartment uh, and the person who wants to stay there actually communicate directly with each other. That's actually how you create trust, right? So, uh, so just communication, direct connection, is it just has huge impact on that side. And then obviously also on the social communication side, it has a huge impact. I mean, you've seen one unique thing about mobile is you have this new wave of, you know, you look at WhatsApp and, and you know, other companies that have grown to hundreds of millions of users really, really fast. Um, 
in part because you actually have the ability to connect into somebody's address book and enable this kind of new wave of communication. Yeah, I think so. that's important. I want to um, draw uh, a point out here, which is that uh, web was a catalog of, of self-service. I put up the best stuff I got and invite you to come partake. Self-service. Mobile is about service. Delivering exactly what somebody wants, exactly when they need it, exactly in their context. You guys have all mentioned service as a component mm -hmm of what you describe the difference between mobile and web. So we're talking about the service economy. This is the heartbeat of our domestic economy and of the world economy. And mobile is an enabler of better service, better, more cost-effective service delivery. Would you agree? Mm. Yeah? Absolutely. So I'm interested in your thoughts about how mobile is helping us engineer the service economy. How are we improving the services we provide through the mobile experience, mobile data, mobile personalization. Really interested in your thoughts on that, that idea. I know. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll It'll just, define the future, I assure you. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly where we're going at Redfin, and it's certainly what, we're, uh, what I'm obsessed with right now. Um, and I feel like we haven't gotten there yet. You know, I haven't, we haven't gotten to where I want to be. Can you talk um, about it? But Do you have yeah, a but, language but, to discuss but, it? Yeah, well, I mean, let me tell a story. Uh, I mean, a real story, not a, not a you know, once upon a time. Um, one of our agents did this thing that I just thought was amazing um, a couple months ago where, so he's in San Diego, this guy Jordan, he's great. Um, he had some clients in DC looking, f looking at houses that are looking to move across the country to San Diego. They got a, at 9 a.m. Pacific time, they got a notice on their phone that this new house had come up on the market that might match their, their you know, what they wanted. They called up Jordan and said, hey, Jordan, there's this house. Can you go look at it for us? He, looked at, he pulls up his, his calendar of tours. He's like, yep, I got an hour. He, he, he pulls up the app, taps a button to, to call the listing agent. Listing agent says, yeah, key's under the door. We don't even have a lockbox yet because it just got on the market an hour ago. He goes... FaceTimes the client once he gets to the, to the place, takes them through the whole house. They say, great, we want to make an offer. He, makes, he made his, his uh, iPad into a hot spot, pulled up his laptop, made, pulled up a, a form to make an offer, emailed it to them, did electronic signatures. They signed it electronically, and he had the offer submitted by 11 a.m. Pacific. It was accepted by 1 p.m. Pacific. And they had gotten, I mean, so they, from when the, when the customer got the notification for the home, it was 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., they had the home. The amazing part was later in the day, they got two more offers um, at higher amounts, but they were already locked in with our client. Did they have a um, mortgage approval within that time? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, so he, they already had everything pre-approved. Jordan had all of it on his laptop. He sent it all through. Like, so, and, I mean... I say that, and that's like an amazing experience, but that's because Jordan's amazing. Like, that's because he had, he cobbled together the tools to make it work. Um, but that's, but when you talk about engineering the surface on economy, like, I want to make it so that anybody can do that. They don't have to be a tech maven. They can, you know, that the tools are opinionated, the tools we give our agents are opinionated and help them do those things sort of automatically. But automating that sort of stuff, is really, really hard in my experience. The, the, the trend you're seeing in the service economy, which is very interesting, is you're seeing um, a wave of these companies that are, I call, like call them end-to-end -end companies, but basically mm. companies that are wanting to actually control and deliver the entire customer experience, inspired by Uber and Redfin and, and others. Um, and there's something that's um, kind of, uh, uh, it's unexpected that you would see that in Silicon Valley because we're so historically tuned towards things that are like super, super yeah. scalable where you have, like, I mean, WhatsApp had 30 engineers and was bought for $20 billion or something. That's pretty good. But, but um, so you're seeing this wave of entrepreneurs, and they're inspired by, you know, Uber and Redfin and these other companies, but they're also uh, inspired by the fact that, like, uh, you know, Richard Branson has an airline, and Elon Musk is making cars, and Steve Jobs, like, was making phones. You know, a lot of amazing entrepreneurs are actually these full-stack entrepreneurs who are controlling the entire experience. As I think if you want to be able to enable someone to like actually press a button and get this amazing experience, you might need to actually re-engineer the entire thing from the ground up. Yeah. So that's I, what we wrote about <clears throat> in the mobile mind shift. You have to re-engineer the entire operation, the systems, the processes, the technology, the people. Everything has to change to come together to inject service into that mobile moment of need. Right. And as for a large company, that's a very complex 
difficult $189 billion we forecast companies will spend in 2017 redesigning their business processes and systems, what we call their business technology, to serve people in those mobile moments. Right. I think, like, for us, you know, I think everybody here is familiar with, like, how Facebook helps users. But I think the other thing we do is provide connective tissue between businesses and the people they want to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, so today we have, like, over 700 million people who use Facebook, you know, on a phone in some form or another every single day. Uh, and that's like a pretty large audience, whether you be, you know, whether you be Uber or, you know, your Airbnb or whether you're like a mom and pop shop, you know, trying to reach uh, an audience. And I think if you look at the shift for us over the last couple of years, a lot of it has been about building that missionary in terms of, hey, you know, how do we make sure that you reach that customer and get them to install your app or go back inside your app or go to your website you know, at the exact moment you need them to. So I think it's like, that's been like a big part for us, which is like building that connective tissue between both sides of that equation. Yeah. So I want, I want to go to the audience in a minute here for your questions, but I want to probe on this uh, um, notion of once we're delivering service, how do we make money on it? So how do we monetize those mobile moments? Uh, ads are obviously one way that, honestly, I thought wasn't going to take off. Shows how dumb I am. It is taking <laughs> off. It's half your uh, Facebook revenue right now. But let's talk a little bit about how we make money in mobile moments. Where does the money come from? Well, one of the things I think is uh, interesting about the difference of what you see going on right now with, with entrepreneurship and companies, you know, the early days of the web uh, was about putting a veneer on top of existing industries. Yeah. Um, you think about like uh, Travelocity or something yeah. like that, right? It was the same old business model. You still got the, on the same old plane. It's just you bought the ticket a little differently, right? And I think what you're seeing now with, in mobile in particular is people actually remaking the industry as well. Right? They're not just doing lead generation for the old industry or uh, some cosmetic alteration of what, how you interact with it. They're actually going into the industry and changing it, right? And whether that's you know, Elon Musk style um, or Airbnb or, or Uber style, right? Uh, that's the biggest change I think you see. And so instead of making a, um, a percent cut on like a lead generation type business, you're actually now having the business. Now there is an interesting yeah. cut in the, um, you know, sharing economy, which is that you share it with the people who provide the work, but you're fundamentally disrupting the industry, not just feeding it more. Yeah. So uh, on the topic of, of, uh, of monetization, I think, there, so I think there are actually two parts to it. So one part of it, one, so um, the ch one part of monetization is actually, uh, is actually just getting customers on mobile. And, it's a, and, there, and the, the ch they're a very different set of rules. I mean, um, if you look at the, like the, uh, the web, the desktop, uh, there was the benefit of SEO, of basically, you know, of ranking algorithmically in Google search results and SEM and certain kind of proven tactics. And, and the tactics, I think, are pretty different yeah. on mobile. So there's a set of challenges there and a, and a bunch of nuances around, around for example, what the do's and don'ts around how do you work notifications. And, mm -hmm. you know, and the dynamic is, the statistics I've seen are that 94% of apps six months after they're installed are not used, right? So there's massive decay on the one hand. On the other hand, if you can actually become a defining app for somebody uh, in a category, then you're gonna actually like be on, you know, you're gonna be on their screen and you can actually drive a lot more retention uh, than you could uh, if you're on the desktop. So if one part of it is actually just how do you acquire customers? The other part of it is monetization and there are a bunch of sort of nuances within that. So, you know, uh, there's some differences between iOS and Android, which, uh, you know, which Sasha could talk about. I'm sure you guys could, could, could all, all talk about. But, you know, there are now, I think, you know, significantly more Android users than there are iOS users, and Android is growing faster. iOS, uh, you know, Android devices tend to be lower price point devices. And also, if you look at kind of across most of our companies, they don't monetize at the same level. Then you also have the nuance, they have the dynamics around the tablet, which you touched on. And so there are three, four hundred million tablets versus a billion, billion and a half smartphones. Tablets are actually growing super fast. And because they're less constrained devices, they actually oftentimes convert better, depending, you know, because you can actually do things more easily on the tablet. So uh, we, can, we could also drill in specifically within advertising within, mm -hmm. you know, mobile. And maybe Shiram could talk about it, but there's a lot you know, within that topic as well. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I think we should just, uh, thinking about the future, if you're in a publishing business or if you're a right. brand and you're trying to take advantage of placement on somebody's device, that's clearly something you care a lot right. about. So I think we should spend a few minutes really with an eye toward where is it going? How do we improve the experience and that service moment, even though we're bringing a branded, uh, you know, ad into somebody's, uh, into somebody's uh, face? 
Right. You know, you know, I think like, the numbers here are pretty dramatic. Over the last couple of years, I mean, eyeballs have shifted pretty dramatically to mobile. Uh, but I think like the very famous Mary Meeker slide show, like, advertising spend hasn't shifted uh, in equal amounts. I think the numbers we see is around roughly 20% of all time spent across all the media, both digital, non-digital, uh, is on mobile. But only roughly 3% or so of all uh, media spend uh, goes to mobile. Uh, and I think. Uh, this is kind of an existential crisis for pretty much every publisher who just had to deal with, hey, my print subscriptions are dying, so I can't staff up like you know like a foreign correspondent. But now you know my high CPM desktop pages are now moving to mobile, where you know people are not clicking on the ads or people and you're just not making any money. Uh, and I think. You know, for Facebook, this is a kind of existential crisis because if you remember the time of the IPO, uh, we were purely a desktop company. We were making no money on mobile, literally zero dollars. We had no ad products on mobile. So this is as much a problem for, a pretty dramatic problem for us as a company and something to face a lot of publishers. I think we kind of focused on two key themes which solved it for us and I think which we firmly believe solved it for a lot of other people too. So if you look at the advertising industry on mobile, it's basically like a scaled down version in a lot of ways of what people had on the desktop. So the original ads on mobile were scaled down versions of the banner ads that we saw on desktop. So you saw an ad at the bottom of your screen. The interesting, the problem there is that you know on mobile, since it's such a completely different form factor, different medium with such fewer pixels, where you're often just pulling up your app, you want to do one thing, a little banner at the bottom of the screen may not be the best way to get your brand's message across, get them to engage, or get them to like click on your site and go book a hotel, or go book a trip, or whatever you know you want them to do. So I think call it, a Redfin agent. <laughs> right there, you go. Exactly. Uh, so we, I think the first thing we focused on is what we call native advertising. Now, native is an, probably an overused word, uh, but I think what we what we simply call native is can we have ads that fit the experience of the medium they are in. Uh, so for us, if you look at the ads on Facebook, we put a lot of time and effort into making sure they look like anything else on Facebook. So an ad on Facebook, if you're scrolling through the news feed, looks exactly the same, same typography, same font, same experience, same interaction metaphor. Uh, it has the same amount of design work put in. It's A-B tested the same way. And do people click on it more because of that? Um, I think we, people engage on it as much as they do on like other elements in Facebook. So if right? you're in the creative industry, do you need a whole focus on those native experiences for ads? I mean, how do you really turn this into, into money? Right, so I think if you're a publisher, right, uh, and you're, you know, uh, if your eyeballs and DAUs are moving to mobile, you probably need to make sure that your advertising units, how advertising exists inside your uh, app or your website, fits within. So, you know, like, does it look exactly the same? Does it not annoy people? Does it, is it not interruptive in some shape or form? Uh, it's going to be different for every single publisher, and, you know, we're, going, we're trying to help them with, you know, no pitching, but like the audience network. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think this is something which every publisher uh, is going through. Yeah, yeah. James, well, you have like a $200 I, billion dollar mark cap, you don't need to pitch anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so the rest of us can pitch. So I'm going to disagree. I'm going to take a different view on this, uh, and then I'm looking forward to finding something that Jeff and Sasha say to also pounce on <laughs> to, to mix this up a little bit. So, um, go right. go. Yeah, so, I, I, so, so look, I think um, uh, if you look at the story of how mobile monetization has played out so far, um, I think a lot of the wave has actually been um, around the sort of vanity metric of people wanting to get drive a lot of mobile app installs. Right. Mm. So like you right. got some yep. like dude who like runs uh, mobile marketing for Chuck E. Cheese or whatever and he's like trying to get 100,000 app installs right. so we can like hit his number. But like do I need a Chuck E. Cheese app on my phone? Like I hope I don't have to take my kid there more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, so I think that there's a lot of that dynamic which so it's sort of in its classic kind of in the first wave. Um, right. And so there are some innovations like I think the native stuff is interesting in stream stuff. I mean I think is a better or better formats but I believe what's going to happen is we're going to actually hit a point where just driving for app installs is going to work for some companies where yeah. that are actually probably like re-engineering entire businesses, but a lot of companies are driving app installs and it's not going to matter. And that's going to, so what's interesting is what is the next wave of what's going to come. And if you look at the data in advertising, 70% of advertising budgets, digital, digital advertising budgets are actually direct response, which is less about branding and it's more about how do I actually drive revenue for my business. And the opportunities on mobile, I see a couple things. So the first one is cross-device stuff is very real and very interesting. 
companies like Facebook and Apple and Google and Twitter, a few of these guys who actually have identity and they have the majority of their usage happening on the phone, but they also, you know, are able to actually expose you to something on the phone even if you decide to transact in a less constrained device like a tablet. And so I think that is, there's a lot happening there and the data is very clear that you can, you can impact people on their phone and right. then they actually transact in a less constrained device. And if you have identity like these guys do, that's gonna be huge. The second thing um, is I think there's gonna be a very big link between payments uh, and advertising. And so the, the fact that I actually have uh, either a, you know, a, a card that's registered with Facebook, there will be a format that happens across a lot of these big publishers where I see an ad, if it's interesting to me, I could click on it, and then it essentially loads to my card or to my phone, and then when I actually transact in the physical store, I get a benefit. Yeah. And this is the holy grail of marketing, which is basically closing the redemption loop between what you're doing in an ad and, what you're, and how you're actually transacting. And don't you in the think store. Walmart is right. investing here um, to make this happen? happen. You think so great. Twitter just bought a company called CardSpring yeah. that literally is this, yep. right. and this is happening. And Walmart doesn't want right. to see that right. control of that go away, right? Isn't that why they're investing so heavily in things like e-receipts and now going to get into things, allow them to build that loyalty there? Right. Uh, I actually want to touch on the first point, which is I think like, the the dying of the cookie ecosystem is like definitely a trend. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I mean, if you look at most online advertising today, it's based on the idea of a cookie, which is essentially a, a browser. It's not really a person, but a person is not going to use one browser. You have work computers, home computers, iPads, and iPhones. And I think one of the things about mobile uh, is that you now have a much more holistic view of who this person is. So this, you know, you might see an ad on your desktop computer. You know, you might see it again uh, on your tablet. Uh, you might just see the site, but you might actually might make a purchase much later, or so, the other way. So, so this is it's basically mobile assisted commerce. And right. the reality is, if you look at like a retailer, right. You know, a, a big retailer might have 10 to 15 percent of their actual transactions at most happening on the phone, but there is this much bigger dynamic right. around essentially being inspired on the phone and, and transacting on a less constrained device. And like these guys and some other big players who have identity have a unique advantage. So I think the like, battle is going to be for identity. I really think that uh, we're, we're going to get tired. We already are tired of uh, sharing our identity with people mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that we have no control over. Um, I want to come back to that in a little bit, but I also want to turn to our audience sure. to get some of their questions and things that are top of mind for them so we can, uh, we can draw on some of that passion and energy as well. So we have a question from the audience. You have a, a microphone? I think the, the a speaker's thingy. a microphone. Let's start here since it's close to the, to the uh, thingy. Microphone, that's what they call it. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Question for any one of you. You were talking, Ted, about service delivery being the most important thing. What about listening? Where does listening fit into any of this? Do your mobile apps help you listen to your customers? How do you do that? You know, like the NSA is really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean actually listening, not just hearing. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, mobile, you have it with you at all times, therefore, it knows a lot about you. So how does listening enter the discussion here? How does knowing where somebody is, what they're doing, whether they're in a car or, or something, how does listening, and social listening too, of course. Yeah. Um, look, I think when you're building mobile product experiences, mobile gives you access to a whole set of signals you just didn't have access to. First of all, if you're inside an app, our data shows that over 80% of all time spent inside mobile is inside apps. So I think apps have won in a lot of different ways. And if you are building an app, you now know uh, where the person is, you know the time of day, uh, and you, you can, like, you, using the gyroscope, you can, you can figure out so many things which are completely just impossible. So I used an Uber to get here. Uh, it knew where I was. Uh, it could predict how long. It, it knew the traffic patterns. It could figure out how long it's going to take to get here. And all these basically help listen in a way to my current context uh, in ways that completely were impossible when I'm on a laptop. Yeah. So, Ram, did you say 80% of time on mobile is spent in an app? Yeah, so Flurry's data basically... like 20% of time is spent on the home screen? Web. No, no, um, web. Web. Versus web. web. This okay. is the app versus Inside web apps uh, versus battle. mobile web. Yeah, they're not okay. counting gotcha. Safari or, yeah, the Brit browser is an app. That's like Flurry's data. I, I mean, I would say there are also, I mean, there are a lot of ways you listen to your customers on the desktop web that are still always applied. A-B testing, you know, the normal channels that, pe that your customers give you feedback. Um, I, I mean, experimentation is still, I think, the biggest way we listen, you know, in that we try different things and we send them out to percentages of users and we see how people react to them, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, and does that lead to data-driven design? Do you use that sure, information to make decisions about the experience? Can of you course. talk a little bit about that and the impact it has on your business? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, any, I mean, we, we're, you know, you pull up diff Redfin, it'll look different for different people, both on mobile and on web, um, because we're trying to make the best experience. And there's lots of times when I think something's great, somebody else doesn't think it's awesome, and the way we answer that is obviously through data. And I think every other, I mean, I, I don't think we're unique in that in any, in any sense. I think that's, I mean, I know Facebook is doing Do you, that. Is there going to be a backlash against this data collection? Right, because it's yeah, pretty yeah. trivial. I mean, every app is going to get man in the middle and it'll be released what data it's collecting and sending back home. And yeah, yeah. You, know, you start to hear more and more reports like this lately. Is that gonna, is that gonna be a backlash? It's a great question. I think it, depends, uh, I think it depends a lot on what sorts of data you're collecting. We're not, you know, when I say we're collecting the sorts of things, I say we're talking about, um, you know, do people click on the button or not? Um, I think that that's, people mostly think that's relatively benign. If you're, t if you're sort of keeping logs of people's location, um, if you're listening, using the microphone to listen, those sorts of things I think are really, you know, probably not. Yeah, good. I mean, I think the question is about customer, customer benefit. Right. What, what, how's the customer going to benefit? And I agree there's all sorts yeah. of listening going on, but I don't know yeah. if the customer exactly benefits from a lot of it. Indirectly, I, maybe the app gets, you know, the button turns green instead of red. Cause sure, they how does Facebook think about this uh, yeah. problem? Uh, well, I think like we care a lot about uh, what we call like the value exchange, uh, which is for everything single thing we do, what is the value that the person using the app or the advertiser of whom we are serving gets out of it, uh, and we want to make sure that value exchange is completely clear. So a lot of these cases, you know, this could be as simple as hey, you know, uh, like moving, changing a button wait, color. Wait. Hold on, Facebook doesn't exactly have a history of making that value exchange extremely clear. <laughs> Okay, well, I think it's time to move on. <laughs> Next question, please. You want some sparks. <laughs> well, yeah, I, so, uh, yeah. you, you get, I mean, if you want to respond, I feel yeah, like sure. you should yeah. be able to. Well, I think, look, uh, you know, I think we try really hard to make sure that, you know, you see the best thing that is right for you at any given point in time. So, for example, when it comes to advertising, uh, where I think one of our prep calls, we were chatting about this, which is, like, you know, how do we think about, like, privacy versus advertising? And it, we think, like, the best ad is one that is super personalized for you. Right, and this means that we use like the data that we know about you to show you an ad which is way more compelling than something you find useful, as opposed to something you know which you are not as compelling. So I think like in those ways where the value exchange isn't maybe as explicit, but it's definitely making your experience better. Like if we can show you, say, like let's say you're traveling and we can show you, uh, or if you're in the market for in uh, uh, real estate and we can show you an ad for Redfin, that is probably driving value to you, it's driving value to these guys uh, in ways which may not be completely direct, but we think it's enhancing both sides of the equation. Yeah. So we call it the privacy personalization paradox at Forrester, mm -hmm. and clearly we don't know. When you ask people in the moment that they're most annoyed, they will tell you they're most annoyed and they're gonna change their behavior, stop using the app, then they don't stop using the app. So this is a really challenging question, and I think the role of listening uh, actively to know is gonna be important. It also ties back, James, to your point, which is that if it's not valuable to somebody, if a person's not getting immediate benefit out of it, they're not gonna use it. They're not gonna be as interested in using that application. And so when you're a company or a brand or a service provider, you gotta think about how you're gonna make money, but also the benefit to your, to your customer. And if they haven't hit it on both of those vectors, it's not worth doing. That's not a place worth investing. Some of it is just as a business, if you take the long view on it, would be actually understanding what are the metrics to know how much value a customer is getting out of it versus how much you're pissing the customer off right. and to just yeah. and to hold yourself to a really high yeah. standard. So if yeah. you're at Facebook, you'd want to look at, for example, okay, what is the highest performing notification that we send people? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like when someone writes on your timeline and you get a notification of that, like 40% of people click through. Yep. Well, when you run some other notifications, you're going to them, run them in like a very small set of people and figure out what actually performs because if, it's, if you're notifying someone and you're just annoying them, you're not, it's not in your interest to do that. So I think you can do that across you know, running an ad or sending an email or a notification where you look at this sort of positive to negative interaction ratio and you, you want that gap to be very dramatic to know that the, the, you know that the benefit is outweighing whatever the potential drag is. So my, my colleague Sarah Rotman Epps, former colleague, um, was the one that with me came up with this sort of very simple nomenclature of personal, uh, personalization privacy paradox. She left Forrester to join, for, to join Facebook to focus on this problem. So she clearly had passion for it. The fact that Facebook is investing here says that it understands the, that its business is really dependent on getting this equation. The one other thing, again, which is on the advertising front that's interesting here, is you have a world where advertising is all, I mean, Facebook's a driver of this, Google is, where it's all driving towards this uh, real-time, programmatic, bidded, 
kind of environment um, mm -hmm. where you have companies that are incredibly sophisticated that are taking massive volumes of data to then figure out in literally like a couple hundred milliseconds, how do I crunch everything that I know about this particular, you know, uh, uh, you know, ID and actually and uh, and serve the right, you know, ad at the right moment? That connected with the idea that all of a sudden now we have location awareness on our phones, we have beacons, you know. So yeah. like, there's there's huge potential value for a consumer. But there also is increasingly like, you know, there there are more challenges. Right. So. I, I think like what's uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, I, just last comment, and then we'll take the next question. Sure. So. I think what's critical here is basically making sure the consumer has control and mm -hmm. uh, like right. uh, understanding of why they're seeing what they're seeing. So, for example, in the ads on Facebook, any ad you can click the X on the right, and you can say, "I don't want to see this," and that feeds back into our signal saying that's a bad ad, that's not appropriate for the consumer. Yeah. And now you, we actually rolling this feature where you can say, "Okay, why am I seeing this ad?" So a lot of this time, it's about providing consumers with context and giving them control to let them control the experience they're seeing. And we think about engineering the service economy, these kinds of skills and capabilities become very important. Yeah. The question in the back. Yes, please. Um, question for Facebook. You were talking about as you transitioned to become more of a mobile business, you're, that there were two key initiatives. Mm -hmm. One was native advertising. I'm just curious what the other one was. Oh, sure. So I think the other is basically, going back to my earlier theme, is about showing you great personalized content. Uh, and I think this is both true for advertising and non-advertising content. So when somebody opens up a phone and they're using Facebook, you know, they're, they're on a bus, they're waiting in line at Starbucks, uh, you know, uh, maybe they're bored with the panel speaker, uh, <laughs> and, we, and, you know, and we have like a few seconds to get their attention and show them something interesting. So a lot of, I think, what we have got, we've gotten better at is showing you that right bit of experience, be it a story from your friends or being it the right ad. So for example, like what is the ad that you'd be interested in that you probably want to go engage with that drives value to both you and the advertiser? Uh, I think that's a missionary that we have built and we've gotten better at. Uh, we don't try to extend to other people. Uh, and I think that's like the second key part for us, which is like showing great personalized ads as opposed to some ad where you're like, I don't know why I'm seeing that. That's completely irrelevant and annoying. And or worse, you just completely ignore it and does, you don't even think about it. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next question, please. <coughs> so, for the past two years, there's been a lot of discussion about native versus HTML5 and which mm -hmm. one is going to win. And over the past six months, the discussion has shifted slightly to native. Should you build a native app versus a responsive website? So, could you guys touch on that a little bit? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> you should build a, a native responsive site and a native <laughs> app, <laughs> frankly. Um, I mean, of course, it depends on what you're building, who you're building for, how much control you have over the people who are your customers. You know, if it's a, say, if it's an internal app and you can you have control over the devices, but in a general sense, you can't control how your customers are going to be coming to you. Um, some of them will come over the web. Um, a lot of them will go through the app stores. Um, as Sri Ram said, though, I mean, we see apps as being much more sticky. People come back a lot more. You have a lot more. Um, capabilities. Um, and I think one thing that, as you're thinking about native experiences, I think it's extremely, extremely important to understand the platforms. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to, for example, watch all of the location, the geolocation talks from WWDC. Um, if you're actually thinking about building something, figure those out. Understand those APIs, because there's a lot of stuff that a lot of people actually don't know is in there that a lot of interesting capabilities, and the more you know about what the, the devices can do, the better experiences you can create. Um, and most of that, most of those really interesting capabilities, you can't do on web. Right. The other thing I think is like apps and web are fundamentally different. They have very different capabilities, and it's important to make sure you're taking uh, advantage of both. For example, if you're an app, you're on somebody's home screen, mm -hmm. uh, you can send a push notification, which means that an, a, a, you know, a chance to get in front of them when they wake up in the morning or at some relevant yeah. time during the day. I think the the lowest common denominator is just basically replicate your website with your app and have them look alike. But that's table stakes. But I think the folks who do, do it really well make sure they optimize for the different capabilities that both sites can do. So for example, pretty much any commerce app these days has a way to scan a credit card. Uh, and so that you know, it uses the camera, or it uses location, or use push notification. So I think the key is to make sure you take advantage of the fact that these are both different, and they're better at different things, and, and really kind of like you know, capitalize on that. Yeah. Yeah. You guys have any comments on this? Let me say a couple things then. Yes. So uh, there are 200 million active public-facing websites globally, 200 million. There are another 
whatever, 700 inactive. There are at least that many internal sort of company uh, websites as well. We started the app store with a bunch of jailbroke apps before there was an app store. Uh, that's what got me. I'm a software developer, so I got so excited when I saw the guy behind the pizza counter flipping through his icons on his jailbroke uh, iPhone before there was an app store. And, uh, and now we have about 1.3 uh, million apps. That's not very many. That's a small percentage of the 200 million uh, active websites we have. We're easily going to get to 10 million apps in the next five years, easily. It's easier to build them, easier to deploy them. The question becomes, what, when's the, the trade-off between engagement that I get with an app and reach and sort mm -hmm. of don't care, run on any device that I get right. uh, with web? And I'll say one more thing because you, you asked, is this difference between responsive and HTML5. Responsive is an approach to using HTML5 to build a website that works okay on any device. Does it work great on any device? No. It is an absolute lowest common denominator approach. Y'all will use it, it'll suck. <laughs> Sorry, but that's just the way it's gonna be. Right. Um, I wanna touch on something which I think you spoke about, which is about app installs. Uh, I think one thing you know, we, we see a lot of is techniques used on the web now moving over to the app world, and it's taking some time to build the infrastructure for this. So one, reason, one example of this is, if you look like a year ago, two years ago, everybody focused on app installs, which is like, mm -hmm. how do I get my CPIs down? How do I get installed for the cheapest price? But if you look at all the smart people today, they're now focused on app engagement, which is you already have a customer, uh, their app is already on the phone, but it might not be on the home screen, maybe like five screens away, and they haven't used you in a month. How do you get them to open up your app at the right Time. And this could mean through advertising, this could mean using push notifications, this could mean like you know, using you know, posting to Facebook or Twitter or something. But I think like people are move, moved on from just let's get installs to being really savvy about focusing on LTV and focusing on engagement and understanding that it can be both installs or getting people to open up an app yep. again. Yeah. Any other comments on this one? So uh, let's, let's switch gears. Let's talk uh, about wearables. So, Internet of Things, whatever that means, wearables, I think we all know what that means, it's stuff we wear. Um, let's, uh, let's just talk a little bit about how wearables extend the mobile experience, how it changes people's expectations and how they use these, uh, these services we deliver. So, who wants to talk about wearables? Could have heard a pin well, drop. Well, what? I, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. go ahead, Jeff. I'd say Internet of Things, I think, is uh, even more interesting. Okay, talk about Internet of Things. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, that I mean, means I, connected products, right? It's an right. interesting debate, right? Are we going to come to call this just the Internet, or is it going to sure so. just be called Things? <laughs> um, but like, it, one of those two seems clearly like the, the future we're heading towards. And I just think of it as, look, you've got the history of computation is you have software, and then you have sensors that sense the physical world, and then actuators that kick something back out into the world from the computer. and um, if the computer didn't do those two things, it wouldn't be useful to us, right? We wouldn't know what the machine was doing inside. So it started with punch cards and teletypes and then keyboards and laser printers and screens, then audio capture and video capture and video output and all this. And like the history of computation is just us being able to sense, compute, and output more and more sophisticated parts of the real world. Um, and this is just the next step, right? It's sensors. Uh, connected to everything, uh, connected to the cloud and being able to get that data up to do sophisticated computation and then spit the results of that back out into the real world. And so, you know, uh, as Twilio we see this a lot, like where, you know, we're doing all this sensing and you've got hundreds of millions of sensors doing all this work and at the end of it you need to say, oh, the car is pulling up now, text message, alert the person, right? And so there's just sort of this notion of sensing the world, doing computer on it, and then <laughs> emitting something back out to a human being when the results of that computation are interesting to a human. So do you use it to provide service then? Is that a better service because it's connected? That's, uh, is that what you're saying? I mean, what's the, never mind, don't so, go there. James has it, It's just the natural progression like, of, of computation, right? being able to compute on more of the physical world. I heard Tony Fidel, the, um, the Nest guy, Nest guy, said something very interesting. He was talking about the Internet of Things and connected devices, and he said, he said, look, a lot of the stuff that I see is very uh, B to G, so it was B to C, B to B to B. B to G is business to geek. <laughs> I thought I was a really, I, and so I think the question is just like looking at what are the uh, applications that are like the real breakout applications, you know, right. and so. 
there are like because you see some of the apps that you see are just very um, awful early adopter kind of and you know and I think there will be breakout applications. One area where I think you're seeing just a lot of momentum is for example is around home security. Yeah. Yep. So the idea that like I mean I we are I'm embarrassed to say we are I think we're customers I think it's ADT or something and I we probably pay them like a hundred bucks a month or something and it's I mean it is it's kind of a joke, you know, and if the alarm goes off, whatever, then you're calling. It's just, it's kind of a joke. And so there is going to be a future of home security, which will be uh, this sort of mobile, cloud-connected, less expensive, you know, a lot more valuable and intelligent experience. And what is an so, alarm system? It's sensors and actuators, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. So I think that, I think sensors it's- Sensors like motion sensors and actuators like uh, spikes and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've been to your house. Mace. Yeah, exactly, spikes, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, I think the question will be, what are the applications that deliver real value to consumers that, are, that have mainstream appeal? Home security would be one of them. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you want to talk B2G, I think the reason, I mean, I'm going to speak for myself, but maybe for other people, like, I think the reason why you heard silence on wearables is, I don't know how those get out of B2G. Like, I, I mean, uh, and, and I mean, maybe watch form factor works, it might, but I don't actually see it as being that different than your phone. I don't think that there's fundamental differences there in the way that there were between mobile and desktop. Yeah. I don't know if the rest of you agree, like, do you think wearables ever get out of Business to Geek. Is this where you announced the uh, Facebook watch? <laughs> <laughs> no? Yes, let me uh, take a moment now. <laughs> so, in, I mean, in, in as, as the Facebook viewer, the person medicine, has a heart attack. <laughs> in medicine, they clearly do. In medicine, it clearly happens. The one I'm most interested yeah. in is uh, Withings, bathroom scale, Cedric Hutchins. Mm -hmm. He's got 100 apps in the App Store using data from his connected bathroom scale. So, okay, it's part of the whole fitness, uh, you know, personal health mm -hmm. thing. Does that reach everybody? Hell no. Right. Mm -hmm. About five, six, seven, eight percent of people will bother with this right. thing. It's it's as a, as a business, it's very limited. Right. I think, like, but speaking personally and as a geek, uh, I just don't know what the compelling user scenarios are. I mean, I've tried every single one. I've tried the watches. <laughs> I have a Withings scale. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, I have uh, the Fitbit, the Jawbone app. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, the Nike Fuel Band. Like every single one of them. None of them have ever stuck for a combination of product reasons or just me not being terribly interested. So I don't know, like, I want to hear from the audience. Maybe it, there are experiences which are super compelling. I just haven't found which I've personally uh, found super compelling. Uh, and I that's what I'm saying. So, so there's kind of this question around, like, the, the specific form factor when we're talking about, like, devices and watches. Yep. I think generally we're going to have devices that are these less constrained devices. It's a ta like a next gen of a tablet or whatever, where you might do things that are more you know, like uh, more substantial work or more considered commerce. And you're gonna have devices that are a lot more constrained but are easy to carry around, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think, and I think there'll be different, there'll be different use cases for I mean, the two. At, at Redfin, we often don't call tablet mobile. I mean, it's just yeah. not, it's mo I mean, mm -hmm. in some ways it looks more like desktop use. Right. Like yeah. the, you know, people are not, you don't see people walking down the street with their iPad. Like yeah, it's but just you, not. But you know where they are and you have an app experience. Totally. So they I mean, are totally, neither feast like, nor fell, perhaps. That's true. Like it's, it is a different experience than desktop, you're right. But it's because you watch think, a lot more TV on them. Yeah, but we think that mostly people are on their sofas. Yeah. They're not out at open houses. They're not in front of the house trying to figure out what it looks like inside. So the data actually things. doesn't support that uh, as strongly as you would think. So we track a lot of this data at Forrester, and tablets are not as mobile as smartphones at all. They are way more mobile than than right. laptops. So, totally. but, but I think right, there's some, I think there's some fundamental differences in phones and tablets. For example, if you go talk to gaming companies, they will mm -hmm. tell you their you know their average revenue per person on a tablet is way more than somebody on a phone because people on engaged. a couch or in bed just right. playing away and doing more things. Same so with people who can afford a tablet. I mean, right. th that's or, a, that, that's I mean, actually, there's a selection that, bias, right? Exactly, right? Or same with commerce, right? Yep. You definitely see way more commerce activity with more pixels and more time. So yep. I think there are definitely fundamental differences between, I mean, they're more mobile, for sure. They're not desktop, yeah. but they're definitely different from a yeah. phone. Yeah, I agree. Let's take a uh, question from our audience, please. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Hi, my question is about uh, buying in the mobile moment. What's happening today, and how do you see that evolving? I'm sorry, so one more time? Uh, my question is about buying in the mobile moment. Buying in the mobile moment. And what's happening today, and how is it evolving? Right, so my colleague and co-author Julie Osk is, uh, is all over this uh, buying in the mobile moment versus uh, mobile to influence purchases, as James, you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any, anything to comment on this, uh, the differences here and how mobile affects buying? I mean, I would agree with James, what James said earlier, that we see a lot of cross device. Uh, we see a ton of people adding a home saying, hey, I want to tour this home, but not necessarily going through the whole 
uh, sort of experience of saying uh, and signing up for a tour, but then signing up for a tour to go out with an agent on either their tablet or their desktop. Um, the proportion of people who actually go through the whole flow on mobile is much smaller. Um, so I definitely agree with that. What so fifty percent of millennials said one uh, auto industry uh, research company are researching cars on their phones. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to sell a car, you better uh, you better have a, an app or a good uh, web experience for for that. Uh, Julie but, talks about two things. She talks about uh, uh, sort of impulse buys. And that's interesting, but maybe not that interesting. She talks about considered purchases in this multi-step, multi-device over time. And she talks a lot about showrooming and the impact of mobile and the in-store experience. About 40, 50 percent uh, now of, of, of online uh, web traffic is mobile. But more importantly, um, I don't have the number in my head here, but the percentage of people that pull out their phone in store to get something done is just skyrocketed here. And retailers have finally figured this out. They finally realized, and the data is quite clear on this, that people that actually pull out a phone and try to engage with your product or your Wi-Fi network while in the store are better buyers, they're better customers than people who don't. So showrooming is it's time to embrace. When you think about service, if you're a retailer, what do you pull out a retail store for? It's to provide service. Why wouldn't you take advantage of every service capability you had, including the mobile device, to do that? I, I had this amazing showrooming moment, sorry, just to tell Please. a quick story. Uh, like two weeks ago, I was buying a new barbecue, and I went to Orchard Supply Hardware, and they had all these barbecues, and this guy sort of talked me through all of them, and there was this Weber, and I was like, I don't know, and I started, so, I, so he, he sort of left me alone for a little bit. I pulled it up on my phone and was looking, same price on Amazon, same price everywhere else, and like 10 minutes later, he came back, and he said, hey, you know, just FYI, Weber has prices set, they're set on every retailer, they're all the same. Um, so, you know, if you look it up on your phone, you're gonna see the same price, but we're, we're having a, a, a tax-free event at Labor Day, and my manager uh, will, has allowed me to, to, to extend that to you if you want. And I was like, done, we're done. <laughs> like, I'm walking out with this grill. <laughs> and I thought it was such That's a great. smart, I mean, and I was really Orchard impressed Depot? because, uh, no, Orchard Supply. Orchard Supply. I was really surprised because it was actually a smaller yeah. uh, company, but they, um, but they knew, and like I mean, they, I mean, it's Silicon Valley, like, and, and he and he really he he used the showrooming yeah. moment to get me back. Yeah, that's that was, fantastic. Like, so, so impressive. Home Depot's finally figured this out. Um, CEO Blake came out in November and said, "Well, we're going to miss earnings because our mo our customers are more mobile than we thought we were. We're going to spend three hundred million dollars to fix the problem, three hundred million dollars to improve our technology systems to serve our mobile contractor and mobile customer." Came out in April, and said, "We're going to spend one point five billion dollars." serving our mobile customer. Now where did the extra $1.2 billion of spend come from? It came from the fact that he has to build distribution centers so he can fulfill in store, order on phone, fulfill in store within 36 hours. He can't do that without building these distribution centers because contractors don't want the 30,000 SKUs in the store. They want the 300,000 SKUs in the distribution center. So when you think about the impact of mobile on that retailer, on that buying experience, it is forcing a huge overhaul of the technology, of the infrastructure, of the supply chain, of the capabilities, of the processes. That's the future of mobile. We are just getting started on how mobile will affect the rest of how we live and how companies organize to serve us. Is that mobile or is that Amazon? Uh, <laughs> it's the fact that the contractor is there with his mobile device wanting to buy that window sash. He'd like to install tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Where so they're standing in the store. That's the implication. They're standing in the store. No, no, no. They're in the, they're in the home. They're in the home and they want to buy in store. When he goes to the store, he wants to go have not have to, to uh, swipe to pay. He wants to have already paid for it. So anyway, uh, let, let's take another question from the audience. Uh, well, we've got a microphone thingy going on here. So someone over here wants to ask and we'll start here, please. Hello. Uh, so my, um, my uh, question, it's, it's actually kind of a challenge. It's on the wearables piece. I believe I heard you saying that um, some of you don't think that wearables are going to go beyond B to G. I think I'm the only one who officially said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I don't carry a purse. I don't want to carry a wallet. I'm the kind of person who, if I could put a chip in my arm and make sure that it's um, secure, I want to be able to use that chip to do payments in store. Mm. I want to be able to use that instead of using my badge. I want to be able to use that to get inside my front door. I, I carry two phones today. I've dropped my phone so many times and you know, cracked the screen number of times and gotten you know, splinters in my finger from these, these cracked screens. And I'm sure a lot of people here have lost their phones, right? It, phones and, and devices carrying them is frustrating. So would you wear a watch then? 
Uh, well, yeah, but so my... What watch do you wear today? Oh, I don't wear a watch. Oh, would, you, <laughs> would you wear a watch? Did I? Would you? Would I? Sure. I will. That's so much my question to you. Where, I, you know, I, I, you had that kind of blank comment on the wearables. Where else do you think it might go? I mean, on, you know, when you're talking about the glasses, watches are great probably for apps, but glasses, how about being able to walk up to a store and look at something and you know how much it costs and, yeah. you know, what the competitors are doing with that, as opposed to having to scan something with your phone and checking it out. So, so anyway. Let me give you a couple of thoughts on that and you guys can jump in uh, as well. Uh, my colleague JP Gounder looks at wearables in uh, the service industry, so where people are going out and doing field service. And Google Glass or something like that is helpful there because you can see the schematic and how to fix the printer or the jet engine or whatever it is you're doing. It's also showing up in the operating room sort of in experimental ways. So medical and service, uh, sort of B to E, if you like, is one place. Medicine is another place where it'll show up. Uh, the most expensive uh, readmission for congestive heart failure happens and is entirely uh, avoidable. It happens because the medication is miscalibrated to the patient's needs. And you know that because they're gaining weight at a very rapid pace. So if you had a connected bathroom scale that the patient stood on every morning and command and control center knew what, that they were gaining weight quickly, they could say, look, we need to see you. Come on in so we can adjust your medication. But what happens instead is they have another congestive heart failure and they're readmitted in is acute care. So the Cleveland Clinic, and we did write about this, Cleveland Clinic is wondering how they change the healthcare payment system to allow them to give a $100 connected bathroom scale and staff up a clinical group to be able to monitor this kind of patient outcome. So we'll see it in medicine, we'll see it with glucose meters and other places as well. Those are some places, and we'll see it in the watch, of course we will, but not, you know, catch me wearing one, I assure you of that. <laughs> any, any other comments on this one? Great, so I think we have one <laughs> or two more questions. One more question, time for opening. Here it is right here, thank you. So if we are gonna go from one million apps to 10 million or greater apps over time, how are you gonna make sure that uh, your app is discovered and what about the content within those apps and how do you get that to be surfaced up when you, you're looking at 10x growth over time? Yeah, do you guys wanna, wanna go after this one? This is a really, I think, hard and, da and sort of scary thing about the new world. Right. Um, I think that, that uh, a couple things. I think the world of App Store SEO, uh, search engine optimization, is very, um, you know, is, is not yet formed in some ways. I mean, there are people working on it, but I think it's gonna become a much bigger thing. Um, I think that the app stores themselves have tremendous uh, pull with what gets installed. Um, there's a huge, huge benefit to being promoted by, uh, by the app stores. Huge, un, un, I can't emphasize how much it changes when you are promoted by the app stores. Um, and then I think that people who have, or companies and people who have users' attention um, right now, uh, like my, uh, my colleague to the, to the left to my left, uh, become much more powerful in terms of getting, uh, getting those apps on people's devices. Uh, okay, so that, a couple other ideas, I mean, so I think Deep linking is a thing that's yeah, significant that's now. Should, and should, so the idea that if you actually have an existing relationship with customers on the web or on the desktop, being able to actually deep link them actually, actually into value within the app, yep. that's, I think, something that will be significant. I think search is going to be reimagined for the phone. It yeah. just will, I mean, just because the current paradigm of search, um, just, you know, when, when you're kind of in this app world, it's going to be, it's going to be reimagined. There'll probably be some opportunities there. Some of it is actually, Understanding whenever these open distribution windows kind of rise up and like stepping in and capitalizing on them. Mm -hmm. So many companies that have been successful in the consumer space, whether it was, you know, it, it, when something opens up on Facebook or back in the day on, 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 on MySpace or on YouTube, it's actually how do you penetrate some existing platform kind of in the early days and, 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 uh, and capitalize on the opportunity. And then it's also just knowing the nuances around things like, um, you know, you're generally not going to get people to create as much stuff on their phone, but they are going to curate a lot of stuff on their phone. So, you know, like some people reblog stuff uh, on Tumblr, or people will repin something on Pinterest, and that actually provo provokes a lot of the sharing uh, and the spread. So it's understanding that, and then understanding the nuances of notifications, which, which we talked about earlier. It's knowing that you want to send a notification if you know if a friend is trying to communicate with you, or there's something timely or a reason to communicate. As opposed to, um, you know, as opposed to not. And finally, it's like also details like, don't ask me to rate your app the first time I used it. Right. Like right. If, I, if I met you today, like yeah. you yeah. wouldn't say, hey, can you write me a recommendation? Right. You know, like, 
like use, let me use the app five or six times and, and then actually ask your engaged users to rate you. It's, so it's all the nuances. <laughs> but, but I mean, but I mean to, to, to challenge you on that, yeah. do you know why people do that? Because they don't come back. Be, because, no, because it works. Because it's actually, I, mean, I, yeah. I just want to say like dri ratings drive app store rankings so much yeah. that that actually works. And right. that, it's, it sucks for users, but it yeah. works. You know, uh, Sorry, the, well, like, it's about I just getting say, the equation right. Two other quick things, uh, yeah. just technologies that I think uh, James pointed out that I think are important. Uh, Google is now doing uh, indexing, starting to do indexing of screens inside apps, which is really interesting. It's still in a sort of fetal stage, but it's called uh, app indexing. It works for Android apps. Uh, and the other one is Facebook has this awesome. Um, new platform called App Links that you, we were you, launch. You stole my we, answer. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> we were a launch partner. So oh, awesome. I, 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 anyway, so why don't you talk about App Links? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so I think uh, you know, like that kind of touches on the deep linking comment, which yeah. is if you look at apps today, they're fairly siloed and they don't exactly talk to each other. And I think like you know uh, what deep linking does, and you know, and I think you know we help that with App Links is find ways to for apps to talk to each other. Even simple things like hey, you press a button, you go to an app, you know, and you. Press press another button, you can go back to the first app. Just enabling simple experiences, being able to send data between apps, and opening up discovery points uh, within apps, I think is like going to be a big part of it. We we have a play here with AppLinks, an open source standard. Uh, yeah. Like you know, we have like a bunch of awesome partners. But I think this idea that apps can connect and communicate with each, with each other, yeah. and not just have the App Store be the sole discovery mechanism, I think is going to be a big deal. Uh, yeah. Apart from that, you know, we obviously care a lot about just showing uh, you a suggestion or an ad for the right app at the right time, uh, and I think that's probably definitely going to be like a discovery vector too. Yep. When you, so uh, last word, uh, when you think about uh, delivering service into somebody's mobile moment of need, you have to know who they are, what their need is, and you have a choice as a company to be present or be absent, even if they don't know they want to use you yet. If you deliver something that's substandard, that's marketing and not utility, they won't use you, they won't come back. So companies that are kind of making this marketing's problem, Get me, get me on those those phones. Mm -hmm. Is not thinking about yep. the mobile mind shift. They're not yep. thinking about the fact that their customers are there on a mobile device, ready to engage, and the company has a choice to make: to be present or be absent. The reason I tell the Home Depot story is that it was a very painful, come to Jesus type moment for the CEO to say, "Oh my God, the contractors want us, and we're not there in their moment of need." Guarantee you the contractor will have the Home Depot app on their phone if Home Depot can deliver the goods. Right. Every one of your companies has to think in the same way. So that with the last word, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our speakers again for sharing their wisdom and their points of view so candidly. We really appreciate it. You totally kept pitching and bragging to a minimum, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, as a small appreciate token of our appreciation, we have for you the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Right. Oh, wow. wow. Please wear that in good health. Thanks thank again you. to Forrester and Citrix. Couldn't have done this without you. And as a courtesy to you, copies of the Mobile Moment, a limited number, are available for purchase this morning. And Ted has graciously agreed to stick around for a short while to personalize your copy if you wish. A video recording of this program should be available, if not later today, tomorrow on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Churchill Club. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much and hope to see you soon. Good day.